So the first IAC conference, I actually started by reading out a poem. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that this time. <laughs> but I have been instructed to wake you up after your post-dinner or post-lunch slump. So hopefully I can give you something to actually get you going. And what I'm going to be talking about is voice interfaces and how all of this stuff that's happening with AI is actually impacting what's going to be happening with them. And the first thing to acknowledge <laughs> is almost nobody uses voice interfaces right now. They're terrible. They are super awkward to use. They don't offer much utility. They are a science project at the moment looking for applications. And you can see this through things like Amazon's massive investment of over 10 billion a year for many years. And they've effectively ended up with something that's a maybe slightly more useful clock radio from the 80s or 90s. <laughs> because all people use the speakers, smart speakers for pretty much is playing music and setting alarms, telling it to play Baby Shark or setting a cooking alarm when you've got your, your hands full. And I saw this for myself at Google when I was things like Google Assistant, incredible technology, but really solution looking for a problem. And so the big question is, do things have to be this way? Are voice interfaces just a bad idea that is, we're going to look back on in 20 years and say, oh, that was just a, a ridiculous fad, and we're never actually going to see anything useful coming out of this voice stuff? So the question I always ask, like to ask people is, OK, you're sitting next to somebody on the couch and you want to ask them a question, or you want to make a decision, or you want to ask if they want a cup of coffee, do you text them on their phones, or do you just turn around and actually ask them uh, using speech? And apart from a few Gen Z people, pretty much everybody has said, oh yeah, of course, we turn around and talk. And when I push on that, okay, why do you make that decision? It's, it's easier. It's quicker, I can get across more information. And the obvious inference from that is, OK, it's not that people don't like voice interfaces at all. It's that they really don't like the voice interfaces that we've given them as technologists. So this leads me to believe, and a lot of my work is based on this idea, that if we can actually do a good enough job at helping voice interfaces and machine interfaces in general beyond voice actually do a better job of understanding us, actually listening to us, understanding all sorts of cues that we give, um, then people will start using them. And that leads to the approach that I've been spending a lot of time on with my startup, Useful Sensors, which is trying to make it as easy to communicate with everyday objects as it is with another person. And I've heard this called social mimicry as a design strategy, but that's really just a fancy term for thinking about all of the ways that we understand other people when they're interacting with us and trying to help these interfaces that we're building actually do a much better job of using that sorts of information. So, one of the things you might notice is when you're talking to somebody, you don't have to structure your sentence in an exact way. You don't have to say, 
Alexa, turn living room lights on in exactly that order to get the result you want. There's a whole bunch of different ways that you can express these kinds of intents, and there's a whole bunch of context you can use from what the previous conversation you were having with people, so you don't have to specify everything all the time. And you can be very informal and relaxed and not have to think about it as like a command line interface. So that's one of the key aspects. There's so much more than just speech. Like at the moment, you have to say a wake word for all of these voice interfaces. You have to say, hey Siri, Alexa, OK Google, and sorry if everyone's phones went off. We don't have to do that with people. You don't have to say, Peter, would you like a cup of coffee every time? We know that somebody's talking to us because they're looking at us. They're making eye contact. And that's another important aspect of this. If somebody's looking away from an object, then you can make a pretty good guess that whatever they're saying is not directed towards it. And we get feedback from body language and from all sorts of other cues when we're interacting with other people. So these are some of the key elements of what I believe will be a much improved, a much better voice interface and general interface that behaves a lot more like a real person. And you might think that's impossible to achieve. Trying to have something that is that good requires solving the general intelligence problem, which is who knows how far away that is. But if you have pets, I would bet that most of you actually talk to your pets, even though you don't expect them to be able to talk back or understand every nuance of what you're saying. But talking, using gestures, using body language, all of this sort of stuff gives us a much better, a much closer way of communicating with these little creatures than we have with any of the machines or objects in the rest of our lives. And it doesn't have to be, like they don't have to get it all the time. They don't even have to have a very rich understanding of what's going on. If your robot vacuum cleaner could just understand you saying, no, stop that, because <laughs> it's about to start running into some kind of mess, or maybe you could actually get it to follow you by saying, come here, and gesturing. I think that alone would be way more useful than the existing kinds of interfaces we have with computers and all of these embedded objects at the moment. The good news is pretty much everything that I've been talking about is now possible to a greater or lesser extent using artificial intelligence, using all of the latest stuff that's happening in AI. We're able to do gaze detection, have a small camera that's actually able to detect if somebody is looking at you, if you're an object. We can dispense with this idea of having to require wake words for every interaction. It also really helps to know, hey, who is talking? Is it, is it the parent or is it the three-year-old child who maybe you don't want to be able to turn on the blender or whatever it is that you're, <laughs> you're trying to control? Doing face recognition all running locally actually can really help with that experience too, as can doing lip reading so that you can pull out just the audio of the person who's actually talking. So if there's a cocktail party happening, you can actually still have people be able to interact with objects and just pull out their particular speech. The whole question of actually taking natural language, the reason that all of these existing voice interfaces I always feel like they are like command lines where you have to say things in an exact order that the designers of the system expect is because we didn't have such rich ways of dealing with language and 
the new wave of LLMs lets us do some really interesting things in saying, hey, there's this phrase, turn on the lights, recognize all the different variations of, that people might possibly use instead. There's a whole bunch of work, if you look for intent recognition, and sometimes slot filling as well, which is related. There's a whole bunch of papers. There's a whole bunch of work around taking all of this new stuff that's happening and just being able to turn in speech into... Uh, and I actually have some demos of this stuff tucked away, if you come and find me after the talk. So this is an industrial conference. You might be wondering, okay, what has... Siri, Alexa, all of this sort of stuff, that's never traditionally been part of the industrial world. Those have all been consumer facing. We are actually finding a whole bunch of use cases where voice makes sense on the factory floor. One of the ones that we're most interested in and we're seeing a lot of uptake with is just translating language between two different people who are on the same team or who are, but are from different cultures, don't share a common language or don't speak it well enough. There's so much work happening in an international context now that what we find is often there's a massive productivity hit from having to have extra people around just to handle the translation. If you're actually able to offer real time, better than Google Translate, instant, I sometimes call them closed captions for real life translations, so that you can have a conversation with somebody in a different language as easy as you can watching a foreign movie with subtitles. We found that to be incredibly useful for a whole bunch of industrial situations, and especially if it's running locally, so that there's no cloud connection required, which is really one of the hard requirements we've found for working in these environments. It's very hard to guarantee that you have any kind of connectivity at all, let alone something rich enough to run cloud-based apps, and also ensures the privacy, and is able to work in very noisy environments. So things that I was talking about trying to do lip reading when there might be a lot of machinery happening and things like that, they really come in very handy. Another place where we've actually seen a whole bunch of applications is if you imagine being able to ask a piece of machinery, hey, why are you making that funny noise? And again, this is probably something that's in the user manual, but the idea of keeping around these user manuals for every single machine on the floor, they rapidly get lost. So having something you can actually query, and any worker can query through natural language, can just ask through speech, and again, is running entirely locally so that they can get information about how to maintain and fix and safely operate these machines. We think that this is going to be a really big trend and something that is a place where these kinds of voice interactions can actually shine, so that you're not trying to help people navigate through some horrible kind of screen-based interface, but they can use a very natural approach to trying to solve the problem that they're dealing with. And it might be funny to see this as the last one, but in some ways this is a little bit further out, at least for doing full sort of high levels of machine control. A lot of people want to be able to give very detailed instructions to a robotic arm, for example, and have it actually understand those and then take action on those. I think that's a long way away. There's still a lot of research that needs to be done to solve that sort of problem. But if you go back to the idea of pets and being able to just do simple things, being able to ask something to stop and have it stop, or even, God forbid, hear a scream, and we as people know to stop what we're doing and look around and find out what's happening. If we can just program in 
some of these very straightforward behaviors as initially as like extra safety safeguard for all of these devices, then I think we've got a way of incrementally building up to something that's a lot more complex, but we don't have to boil the ocean to get there. We can actually just start with something that's pretty simple. I want to leave maybe a minute or two for if there's one or two questions, but really what I want to end with is this idea that Voice interfaces are terrible, nobody uses them, but they can be awesome, <laughs> and I think we've actually got a bright future ahead of us. The slides are all available at the link that you see down the bottom if you want to follow any of this stuff. But yeah, I'd love to see if we have time for a question or two. How do you think that implementing low-hanging fruit like real-time translation can provide a pathway for more integration of embedded technology, particularly as it comes to user trust or acceptance? Yeah, that is a really big question. And a big problem that I didn't touch on with the voice interfaces is a lot of them were essentially data grabbing schemes for the big tech companies. Like they wanted to be able to do voice interfaces so that they could drive traffic and get more information to search and all of this sort of stuff. And most people actually believe that their voice assistants are spying on them, if you actually look at the surveys. I think it's really important to focus on things that actually offer immediate benefits for people on the ground and make sure that it is entirely local so that they know that this is air-gapped, they know it's not going to be used to spy on them. We operate in union-driven environments, where there's actually a lot of power given to the workers, where they can just say, no, we don't want this spyware listening to everything we're doing. So I think a lot of what we have to do is step back from that big tech mindset of, we're going to vacuum up all your data, and really try and say, OK, what are the practical things that actually help people in their jobs that they're going to welcome? And how can we give them real safeguards so that they feel secure that this stuff's not going to be use the spy on them, essentially. I think that's the starting point, and then hopefully we can incrementally build from there. I missed the early intro. I'm not sure if Pete was properly introduced as the founder of TinyML. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did Google. get a push. <laughs> yeah, which is an effort to put models on tiny chips, right? And then associated with that, there's a TinyML foundation, which Professor Boris Merman, most recently at Stanford, was also involved in. I think there's a lot of opportunity in that in terms of certainly from edge computing point of view, but also the return to industrialization, the IC design and so on, right? Can you talk a little bit about TinyML Foundation perspective yes. and what's, what's happening there? <laughs> yeah, so I haven't talked much about the, the wider picture. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that you can actually run large language models on comparatively cheap hardware with no network connection. So running, and when I say comparatively cheap, I mean below $10, sometimes below $5. When you look at what's happening with AI, you often see a lot of chat GPT and other stuff that's very cloud-based and GPU-based, and you might think, oh my god, I need a data center. I need thousands of dollars of GPUs to be able to do this. TinyML, at its heart, is really about this idea of, hey, let's actually explore and expand and promote all of the things that we can do with these latest AI techniques running locally on existing hardware. And there's a lot more to the TinyML Foundation. We've been running a series of conferences ourselves, and there's a TinyML book and everything else. But that's something I'm always happy to chat about if you want to come and find me afterwards.